probably not the slide that you wanted to see then if we wanted to end on a high note. Um, yes, thank you very much, James, and thank you to the organisers uh, for accepting my paper. Um, I follow up on many of the points that were made earlier on by, uh, the by my fellow speakers, and I will sort of allude to them every once in a while. Do you want to come in, Kaz? You sure? Okay. I'll allude to them um, every once in a while. I'd like to introduce my two heroes, or at least two of my heroes of this story. On the left we have Magnus Maximus, on the right Constantine III, <laughs> and I shall explain more about them in a little while. What I want to do is think about some of the topics that have been raised today and that are pertinent to understanding the 5th century, um, and give you a couple of uh, my own experiences when dealing uh, with material from this period. I fit into a particular box professionally. I'm an archaeologist, and I, within that big box, I fit into a smaller box. I'm a Roman archaeologist, so my period starts in 43, and it ends in <coughs> 409, 410, something like that. That's the box that I have inherited uh, academically, uh, both um, uh, in the broadest sense and also within Cardiff University. I don't find those boxes particularly helpful, I have to say. Um, when I end, I hand over to my colleagues Alan Lane and to John Hines and they pick up the story and then when their period ends they hand on to somebody else and it seems to me that these sort of artificial uh, boundaries that we have created over the last 200 years actually hinder rather than uh, help in any way whatsoever. A bit of politics to start with, Magnus Maximus I alluded to on my first slide. The beginning of the end of Roman Britain began, you can argue, maybe in the beginning of the 4th century, but certainly by uh, the reign of uh, the usurper Magnus Maximus in the 380s. Um, he was a usurper who took many of the troops, we're told, from uh, Britain across onto the continent in order to support his claim to the imperial purple. There's a potted history of what happened uh, between 383 and 388. He was defeated, captured, and um, executed, and I hope the same happens uh, with my hero on the front slide in many ways. Um, the history of the beginning of the end then moves on to the final usurpers, uh, Marcus, Gratian, and Constantine. This is a lovely coin, a gold solidus of the Emperor Constantine III, defeated, surrendered, and beheaded in 411, there or thereabouts. Roman Britain did end. We can't argue that there wasn't an end to the Roman period in Britain. It ended politically, and we can date that reasonably well. We're told when these ha things happen. Our obsession with dates, though, is perhaps unnecessary. We don't need to know precisely when something happens in order to be able to understand its consequences, and that's perhaps, as material scientists and archaeologists, what we need to be more concerned about. Zosimus, writing later in the eastern part of the Roman Empire, is very clear what happened and why, why Britain ceased to be part of the empire. And he states it explicitly. Whether it's true or not is something we can debate, but he states that it was the population of Britain or the leaders of, the, um, uh, of Roman Britain who decided to secede from the Roman Empire. They threw out the administrators. The legions left, but so did the administrators, and so did the tax collectors, which was one main reason, we understand, uh, for this particular separation at the beginning of the 5th century. Around about the same time, from an entirely different perspective, we begin to see the consequences of perhaps these decisions that were taken um, at the end of the 4th and the beginning of the 5th century. Gildas describes how he sees some of the bad um, or negative consequences of the decisions that had been made, and he also knows who to blame. He blames the tyrants at the, at the end of Roman Britain and of the uh, succeeding centuries uh, in Britain, in part because they invited in barbarians for various purposes. All of this fits into a narrative that we know very well, the decline and fall narrative, which doesn't begin with Gibbon, but is probably encapsulated uh, by him uh, at the end of the 18th century. And we still follow that narrative now. We heard it today a little bit. However, Decline and fall. I mean, when you were standing in 408, if you were around in 408 or 409 or 410, did you know that anything was going to happen? Did you know that there was going to be a fall? Could you have perceived that you were involved in a process of decline? Why do we see change necessarily in such negative terms all the time? And what is the decline set against, as was mentioned in the previous paper? The period of the Flavians, the Antonines? Uh, the Constantinian emperors, what are we, when we're talking about change in negative terms, 
we need to be more specific, I think, about exactly what we mean by decline and fall. Nevertheless, until now, this is the narrative that drives how we describe the end of Roman Britain. It was a fall and it was therefore a decline. That doesn't necessarily work for all of us and there are different parties, if you like, who try and understand um, the fifth century, the short chronologists, those who see this decline and fall as being very abrupt and certainly a decline and fall. There are others more recently who see themselves perhaps as long chronologists for whom change is less about this sort of moving away from an ideal Roman version and more a slower progression towards something else. So culture change rather than political change necessarily. And each of us probably feels that we fit into one or other of those camps. And those were described in previous papers too. The archaeology though of the 5th century is much more complicated than this simplistic political narrative that I've tried to summarise very briefly. And one of the areas of material culture that I've looked at over the last 20 years or so is the study of coinage and also the hoarding of coins at the very end of Roman Britain. And you can do with hoards what you can do with pottery, what you can do with almost any other kind of uh, material culture. You can put it into a nice sequence that shows when something happened, apparently. And when you do that for coin hoards, we find that there is a large peak of hoarding of coins at the very end of the Roman period, generally that close with coins that uh, were struck between 388 and 402 there or thereabouts. You can then do the next obvious thing, which is to map where those coins are found, and you produce something like this, which comes from Anne Robertson's uh, corpus of uh, Romano-British coin hoards, and you can then try and think about what might explain these peculiar, if they are such, um, patterns both chronologically and also geographically. And the narrative that we have or we've inherited and is constantly being developed to explain this peculiar behaviour or this uncharacteristic behaviour is of course to do with Gibbon's barbarians and to do with Gildas's barbarians too. The threat from outside the Roman Empire was such, we're told, that the population of late Roman Britain decided that one, the only option they had, as, is in capture, as you can see in this um, inset on the top left, was to <coughs> bury their wealth in the ground, to try and keep it safe. And the reason why most people, or why so many hordes uh, uh, stayed in the ground to be recovered, is because the unfortunates in the top left who dug the hole did not survive, or were taken away, or were removed, or for some reason were not around in order to dig up the wealth that they had uh, so carefully um, secreted away. And not just coin hordes, but there are the large treasure hordes that date uh, to the end of the Roman period. I'll come back to that point in a little while such as, of course, the Milton Hall treasure, which Richard Hobbs has just recently um, republished, the Water Newton treasure, uh, possibly the empire's earliest collection of Christian liturgical silver, and the Hoxton treasure too, that I was involved with, uh, with the, uh, identifying the coins behind. That's a particularly, the Hoxton treasure is a particularly interesting <coughs> example of what happens when arbitrary academic disciplines are imposed on complex archeological material. The coins went to the Department of Coins and Medals, and I was one of the special assistants who identified the coins and listed them. Uh, the other objects, the silver plate and also the um, gold jewellery, went to what was then the Department of uh, Roma, uh, Roman Britain and Early Medi no Roman and Early Medieval Britain, where Catherine Johns looked at those objects. There are now two volumes that describe the Hoxton treasure: one about coins, one about non-coins. And the two people who wrote those books come to almost diametrically opposed interpretations of what the hoard actually means. The intention was, at the time, <coughs> to publish a third volume where everybody could come together and we might have some sort of compromise. Unfortunately, that's expensive and it didn't happen. It would have been good to have happened, actually, and to then bring this hoard back together in one place. Hoards obviously are not just buried and coins are not just buried in Roman Britain and looking beyond the English Channel we can do the same kind of exercise that I was describing earlier on. We can map where coins and hoards are found and we can put them into a nice chronological sequence. This comes from Richard Hobbs's uh, book, his BAR, which was published in 2006 
and it shows gold and silver deposits as I've put down here. The caption is gold and silver deposits buried 395 to 411. And in this case, you can see that Britain behaves in a peculiar way. It buries the population of Roman Britain, buried and did not recover their gold and silver, at, uh, unlike other parts of the Roman um, world. Not in Gaul, not in Germany, not in Italy or Spain. And none of those areas produce the same kind of levels of uh, burial of late Roman gold and silver. And yet those places were also subjected to the same, if not greater, pressures from outside the empire. So what's going on? A few years ago, a hoard was found that possibly changes the nature of the conversation. And it certainly is a game changer if you look at it in some detail. The patching hoard, which was discovered some 20 years ago now. And it combines late Roman silver siliqui, the small silver coins that we found so commonly, that are found so commonly in Roman Britain, together with um, official solidity and also what are known as, well, they're Visigothic coins, pseudo-imperials, some people call them, that date to the second part of the 5th century. The latest coin is a coin of Libya Severus that dates to 461 to 465. If you excluded the latest coins that date to the second half of the 5th century, it looks very similar to Hoxon and very many other late Roman hordes. And in the 410 volume that was alluded to a little while ago as well, I published an idea that in which I explained that this hoard and Hoxon hoard and maybe Milden Hall and lots of these other supposedly late Roman hoards are not necessarily late Roman. The objects they contain are definitely late Roman. But the nature of them and also the nature of their burial suggested to me at the time that they are late Roman hordes being buried in a non-Roman context, being buried after the end of Roman Britain, whenever we might, that want, whenever we might uh, want that to be <coughs> placed. It's, a not, it's an idea that doesn't seem to have been particularly well received or necessarily accepted in many circles. However, I was invited or have been invited to restate that point in the, uh, in the publication of the Staffordshire Horde. Early medievalist Anglo-Saxonists seem to be more key, seem to be more aligned to that kind of thinking, perhaps, than my Roman colleagues, for whom this idea of a linear progression of time <laughs> appears to be much more comfortable, much more familiar, um, and much more desirable. Whether anything changes or not, I'm not entirely sure. But for me, the burial of much of this late Roman material is not the end of Roman Britain at all. It's the beginning of whatever we want to call the period that, goes, that comes after the end of Roman Britain, whether we call it post-Roman, early medieval, sub-Roman or whatever, is perhaps an argument we might have, or a discussion we might have. My second example, and the final example, comes from my excavations at the legionary fortress at Kalian. Um, this is a, uh, a plan of what the fortress known as Isca might have looked like. And in 2008 and 2010, I, together with Andy Gardner, excavated part of what we believe was a store building. This is the store building, or what's left of it, with our students showing you where the front range of the store um, was. Uh, the store was constructed in stone at first in around about 100 AD, stood for about two and a half centuries there or thereabouts before it fell down or was deliberately um, demolished, uh, probably a combination of the two. And on top of the remains of this legionary store building, we found <laughs> um, vestiges of another stone-built um, structure that sat directly on top of it. Um, it's not immediately apparent, but at least one building was rectangular, uh, divided into at least three rooms. The central room um, had a large oval pit um, the building was not particularly well constructed. It was made of stone and it's rectangular. It looks Roman, therefore. Um, but the walls were not built on any foundations. They simply sat on top of the remains of the previous building. Um, the consequence of that was that it fell down and it very possibly fell down not long after it was constructed. Stratigraphically, it fits in between the end of the Roman period and the medieval period. We can date it stratigraphically between 350 there or thereabouts and uh, 1300, something like that. So we've got a thousand years in which to fit it. Um, and before we undertook any other work, 
we had to leave it like that. It's post-Roman and finish. We now have five dates, five carbon dates that come from the central pit. And those suggest that the pit and the building with which it's associated was in use and inhabited in the 5th and 6th centuries, sometime between 430 and 600. So we can now narrow down this millennium uh, in which this building was occupied and used to a relatively small period of time, the period of time that we're interested in today. So in Killian, in Wales, there were people living on uh, previous sites or previously occupied sites who seem to have had some memory or some capacity to want to try and emulate, to want to build rectangular buildings in a Roman style, in the Roman style. Whether they were able to do so successfully or not is another matter. The building has been described by proponents of the short chronology, of the short, sharp end of Roman Britain as a shed. Uh, and that's not meant to be a particularly uh, a complimentary um, description of it. And yet, actually, it may well have been a shed. And if I took you to my house and I asked you to judge who I am and who my family are and showed you just my shed, I guess you would get a completely different view of us than if I showed you the inside of my house. And that might be what we're seeing here. So we don't want to look too, um, we don't want to look at this object on its own. We need to see other things too. We're in the western part of Britain, and in the western part of Britain, we know that into the 5th century there were contacts uh, between the Roman Empire, between the uh, Mediterranean and the Aegean, and parts of what are now southwestern England, and also Wales, and further beyond too. We can see those imports that arrive in the 5th and 6th centuries, both in terms of pottery and glassware and other things. So when we're thinking about time, we don't need to think about time simply as a single dimension or as one particular narrative. Time overlaps and it can be multidimensional. It depends where you are, it depends who you were, perhaps, and it depends on how you saw the past, the present and the future. And in Wales it's quite clear that there were groups of people, and in Western Britain there were groups of people who saw themselves in some way as more connected to the Roman past than other people did in other parts of Britain. We don't want to create the keep pers per, uh, pursuing the idea of Roman Britain as this monolithic thing that had a beginning, a middle and an end. There were various Roman Britons and those different Roman Britons could have different timelines. The people in Wales clearly for a great period for a long period of time after 400 maintained some sort of memory of what it was to be a Roman. Whether they thought of themselves as Romans is an interesting question, very hard to answer but maybe something that we could ask, but that might not be as interesting perhaps as whether whether they saw themselves as the inheritors of what it was to be Roman. So the ideal of perhaps being Roman and my penultimate slide, oops, no, uh, I have more slides than I seem to remember, um, <laughs> shows, I think, quite how extensive this uh, idea was. It might not have been limited to the people at the very top of Welsh society or the Society of the Welsh Kingdoms in the post-Roman period. There appears to have been more connection between the Roman past and the post-Roman presence then perhaps is often understood. And in Wales, of course, we know full well that this idea carries on beyond the 5th and the 6th centuries. The Welsh, the early Welsh uh, princes <coughs> and the, early, the uh, kings of the um, early Welsh kingdoms saw themselves as the inheritors of Rome. Doesn't mean to say that they were Romans or they wanted to be Romans, but there was something about the Roman past that they found appealing and that they wanted to maintain. And it wasn't just about the Roman past necessarily that they found <coughs> necessarily appealing. This is the <coughs> pillar of um, Eliseg, which um, Howard has been involved in the study of. And I use it in my penultimate slide because it shows for, for me this connection and the importance of this connection between the Roman past and a post-Roman presence. It's written in Latin. It's claiming succession from Roman emperors and the uh, killers of Roman emperors. And it's what it's effectively doing is saying that if you cross this line, you are coming back into a place that is different to if you don't cross this line. You over there are not Latin readers and writers. You are not the inheritors of Roman emperors. You are the Saxons.
we are the successors of Constantine and of Magnus Maximus. Which brings me back to the present day, uh, the modern Brexit. And it brings us back to the idea that we can make complex problems and complex situations simple. We could do that in 410. It's easy to get rid of the, inherit of the tax collectors and the administrators of Roman Britain, and it'll all be fine. We'll take back control, and it'll be great. Uh, we've been fed a similar line over the last 25 years or so, and after a generation, we made a fairly transformational decision last year, which is going to affect not just our generation, but my children's too, and also their children's into going on into the future. The lessons, if we want to learn lessons, perhaps, if we look forward and use history um, to perhaps, uh, uh, give us a, an idea of where we might end up, is also summarised in Gildas. And maybe, if we use the same sort of timeline, sometime around 2040 or 2050, there may well be a letter written by somebody on this island back to Brussels, the groan of the Britons in the 21st century, suggesting that maybe we've made a mistake and we want to jump back in. Who knows? The people who took us there, these two and various others too, of course won't suffer in the same way as everybody else. They're the big men that were described earlier on. They're the ones whose wealth can be transferred somewhere else. Uh, they might experience a short, sharp political ouch, but I would have thought in the longer term they will not um, suffer the consequences as much as other people. The lesson, if there is one, is for the fifth century in particular, is not to try and simplify complex patterns and to allow the <coughs> complexity of the archaeological material to speak for itself. It doesn't necessarily have to fit into the same political narrative or historical narrative. It is perfectly possible to have different chronologies, different timelines, depending on who you are, where you are, and what the purpose of your study actually is. Thank you very much. Thank you.